My name is Jonah Hahn, and I want to share with you a brief story of mine from two years ago. I intently stare at the form. The instructions clearly state, to vote for a candidate, connect the arrow to the right of the candidate's name. Simple, easy, and brutally anticlimactic. After anxiously waiting 18 years, eagerly anticipating the moment, I arrived to discover a shocking mundaneness. This is it? I felt a bit misled about the significance of the action. Nonetheless, I complete the arrow with my dark felt pen and cast my ballot on November 6, 2012. Leaving the polls feeling exuberant, I pondered how remarkable it was that in a country of over 300 million people, on one day, my voice mattered the same as Bill Gates and Joe Schmo. 38 days later, I watched the heart-wrenching news clips streaming from a small town in Connecticut where a 20-year-old 20, 20 man fatally shot six adult staff members and 20 children. I wanted gun regulation. Enough tragedies, enough devastated relatives, enough. I heard guarantees that there would never be another Sandy Hook because Congress would enact legislation. I waited. I continued to wait. I witnessed an issue I care about get smothered by special interests and lobbying groups. And it has happened on climate change and financial regulations and tax reform. I had the privilege of interning for Represent Us my senior year of high school and have not stopped working on the issue since then. Now I'm a sophomore at Harvard and I play on the men's frisbee team redline in my spare time. The persistent sense of community attracted me to the sport. Its quirks, such as being self-officiated, goofy sideline chants, and an actual term called the greatest, unite Frisbee players together because we share a knowledge of the beauty and camaraderie of the game. Undeniably a niche activity, Frisbee, however, is growing in popularity. While I draw many parallels between my two communities, Frisbee and the anti-corruption movement, the defining characteristic of both is passion. People care. They deeply care. Walking to the fields of an ultimate tournament and recognizing the dedication within each team to give up weekends of school, to train at odd hours, and to pay for plane tickets, I get chills. Standing here now, seeing all of you, I have goosebumps. This is why I try to raise awareness on campus about institutionalized political corruption and campaign finance reform. This is why I am a part of the movement. You are why I am part of the movement. The man I am to introduce is at the heart of this movement's growing momentum. Lawrence Lessig is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and Director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. He was previously a professor of law at Stanford Law School, where he founded the school's Center for Internet and Society. He transformed intellectual property law when he founded Creative Commons, and it was during his efforts to improve intellectual property and cyber law that Professor Lessig experienced firsthand the frustrating difficulties of a political system reliant upon the funders. So in 2007, he set about a more fundamental transformation, fixing the system of corruption in American politics. In 2011, he published Republic Lost, which was a major source of inspiration for this event and for me as well. Professor Lessig founded the activist organization Root Strikers and recently launched the Mayday PAC, which we heard about from Dan Miller, that is a crowdfunded super PAC to end all super PACs. Mayday's phenomenal pledge drive success and originality catapulted political corruption into the national news sphere, not just drawing attention to the issue, but journeying down the path to actual reform. He walked 185 miles across New Hampshire last January with the New Hampshire Rebellion to inspire the state and the nation to take up the fight that Granny D so dramatically publicized in 1999 and 2000. Professor Lessig personifies the best qualities of this movement. Creativity, intelligence, spirit, and motivation. We are honored to have Professor Lessig with us today. 
please join me in welcoming our distinguished and accomplished speaker, Professor Lawrence Lessig. Excellent. So thank you. I, I want to just start by remarking on something that is really extraordinary. These introductions are amazing. I have never been at a conference with this level of care and seriousness and creativity in introductions. I'd like you to join me in thanking these people who have done that. So on August 31st, the Standing Committee of China's 12th National People's Congress issued a decision dictating the procedure by which the chief executive, the kind of governor of Hong Kong, would be selected. See, since about 1997, the chief executive has been elected by something called an election committee. In 2007, China said the chief executive would be elected by popular vote by 2017. But at the end of last month, Hong Kong learned something important about the nature of that, quote, election by popular vote. As the decree specified, quote, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. A committee of 1,200 citizens would select the candidates who get to run in the general election, which given the population of Hong Kong means about 0.024% of Hong Kong gets to decide who gets to run in the general election. So Hong Kong has a certain kind of democracy. There is an election in which all citizens get to vote, but then there's a nominating committee in which the 1,200 get to vote. And to be allowed to run in the election, you got to do pretty well in the nominating committee. It's a two-stage democracy with a pretty severe filter at the first stage. Now, when this was announced, it was, of course, criticized by activists in Hong Kong, the Occupy Hong Kong, Occupy Central movement, leading protests against this proposed, quote, democracy. As they put it, this 1,200-person committee would be, quote, dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elites. It would not be representative. And as they said, it would therefore not be a democracy. Now, of course, Hong Kong's not alone in this structure of a democracy. It's a little better than others, but not alone. Iran, for example, has an election where all citizens get to vote. But to be allowed to run in that election, the Guardian Council, the Guardians, must permit you to be a candidate. So to run, you must do well in the Guardian Council. So 12 people get to select the candidates that 50 million people get to vote among. Or the Soviet Union, similarly, had an election where the citizens got to vote, but to be allowed to run in the election, the Politburo, those commies, had to permit you to run. So to run, you needed to do well in the Politburo, which meant about 19 people got to select for 270 million. If Hong Kong is not a democracy, these are not democracies either. So what are they? Well, we could call them fake democracies, you know, kind of like fake Steve Jobs, but not quite as funny as that. I think we should call them Boss Tweed democracies. Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed, who famously said, quote, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. (laughs) The nominating. Boss Tweed wanted this two-stage democracy where the Tweedies control the first stage. And the consequence, obviously, of a Tweedy democracy is a government responsive to the Tweedies. Now, you might look at that and you say, okay, well, that's a little bit foreign for us. You know, here we are in America. What do we care about these other countries? This is not not America you're talking about. But in fact, if you look back in our history a little bit, there's something very similar to this. In 1870, the United States 
passed extraordinarily an amendment to the Constitution that guaranteed that the right to vote shall not be denied on account of color, race, or previous condition of servitude. Then for 100 years, okay, you're thinking he's exaggerating. I am, okay, right. For 95 years, there was a concerted effort to exclude African Americans from the right to vote. No place more ambitiously than this great state of Texas, which by law explicitly excluded the rights of African Americans to vote in the Democratic primary, thereby creating the all-white primary. Now, that was effectively the case all across the Old South. So across the Old South, we could say there was a general election where all citizens got to vote, regardless of race, at least if you had a chance to get registered. But there was then a white primary where only whites got to vote. To run in the general election, you had to do really well in the white primary. That was a two-stage democracy, a little tweedy democracy. And the consequence of that, obviously, was the democracy responsive to the whites only. Okay, you look at that and say, okay, so foreign and old, but you know, what are you talking about this for now? This is America now. We don't have stuff like that anymore. Would that it were so. Because let's look at democracy in America today. We take it for granted campaigns are privately funded in America, which as that system has evolved, as Marty's slide so nicely characterized, means that representatives for Congress and for the Senate spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power. Huffington Post published this leaked memo from Michelle Nunn's campaign where she was told she had to spend 80% of her time raising money until October where she was told she could spend just 50% of her time raising money, dialing for dollars, calling people they've never met before to ask them for the money they need for their campaigns. Now, as they do this, they learn something. They learn which buttons they must push to get the sustenance they need to make it so their campaigns can survive. B.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box, where any stupid animal could learn the buttons it needed to push in order to get the sustenance it needs. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson <laughs> as he or she learns which buttons must be pushed. Now, as they do this, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters. As they constantly adjust their views in, what, in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000, Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> okay, so then, who are these funders? Who are these people that get called by members of Congress when they spend 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money? Well, I looked at the data to find what we could think of as the relevant funders, the people who are giving enough so that their views might matter, might count, might be the sort of thing that would be thought of by the candidates as they are calling people to raise money. And by my count, it's no more than about 0.05% of America who are the relevant funders of campaigns, which means that at most, about 150,000 Americans, which according to the Internet means it must be right, is about the number of people who are named Lester in the United States, which is why in my TED talk I called the United States Lesterland. And then after the Supreme Court's decision in McCutcheon this year, I think this number was going to fall to no more than maybe about 35,000, which turns out is the number of people who are named Sheldon in the United States. And after the D.C. Circuit's decision creating super PACs, the Speech Now decision, we have an even smaller number who are participating in funding the outside election activities. In 2012, the statistics a little different from Marty Gillen's, um, it was 0.00042%, which of course this is MIT, so you know automatically that is 132 Americans giving approximately 60% of the independent money given through super PACs. So that's maybe about the number of people named Adolf in the United States. <laughs> 
So whether it's Lesterland, Sheldon City, or Adolphia, the point is a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% dominate this first stage of our two-stage election. This is Tweedyism. We have a general election in the United States where citizens get to vote, but then we have a green primary where only the relevant funders get to vote. And to run in that general election, you must do extremely well in the green primary. You don't necessarily have to win. There is Jerry Brown, but on average, people believe you must do extremely well. And so that means 0.05% of us get to make the choice that then sets the stage for 313 million to be represented. A pattern which should echo in a very troubling way from our past. Citizens excluded from a critical first stage of the election. But unlike the Old South, which at least could say, hey, it's the majority who get to participate in the first stage of an election, in New America, it's the tiniest fraction of the 1%. Now, you could say, of course, we're not totally excluded. The Supreme Court was certainly right when it said in Citizens United that the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials because, after all, there is this election where everybody gets to vote. But only after the funders have had their ways with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. So they are excluded where it matters in the nominating the effective nominating, and the nominating of the issues that shall be issues that will be decided by those candidates because there's no way those who are running are going to care about issues other than what the tweeds tell them to care about. And the consequence, of, as we've seen, is a democracy responsive to the funders, and if Gillen's and Page's work is correct, the funders only, the conclusion of their extraordinary paper, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are accounted for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near-zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. This is Tweedism in America today, Tweedism flourishing around the globe today. Okay, now, you know this theorist, Francis Fukuyama, his most famous original book, The End of History. He's a political theorist whose recent writing is about the nature of our democracy. And he says, of course, we don't have a democracy. Nor do we have an aristocracy, nor do we have a plutocracy, nor do we have a kleptocracy. What Fukuyama says is that we have a, quote, vetoocracy, or let's call it a vetocracy. By which he means it's trivially simple to block change. And the reason for that has something to do with what the framers did and the way campaigns are increasingly funded. The framers gave us what they called a republic, by which they meant a representative democracy. That means it wasn't a pure democracy, it was a complicated democracy. It was a democracy that had a complex set of checks and balances built into it. Think of it like a Swiss watch of democracy. All these tiny mechanisms to balance each other to make sure there couldn't be a sway of decisions in response to public opinion. Now imagine taking that complex switch and dropping into the middle of it piles of honey. The Swiss watch coated in honey. Because that's exactly what this does to the framers' democracy. What this does what this means is that the tiniest number of Americans, a really, really tiny number, that's small, you can see, have the capacity to block reform. To block reform because it takes just a tiny fraction of the tiny fraction to stand up and say, nope, climate change, I'm not for that, I'm not for that. Real health care reform, nope, 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 don't even talk about that. Universal health care, don't utter those words. A tiny, tiny fraction to block reform, which means that change, literally any substantial change from the left or the right, is going to fail in this system, regardless of your issue. This is not a left-right point. This is a point that is true regardless of the particular issue you care about.
And the reality that most people in this room, I'm sure, recognize is that until we change how campaigns are funded, sane policy across the range of policies we must address is not possible. We are like a democracy that has lost the wheel on the bus. And any system that cannot be steered is one that will eventually sink. Okay, that's the reality of tweetism in America today. So what can we do about it? The reality of most conversations about what we can do about it is that we can't do anything about it. And the reason most people think this is that they point to this institution, the United States Supreme Court, and they say, Citizens United and other decisions from the Supreme Court make it impossible for us to fix this problem until we have amended the Constitution. And of course, despite the aspirations of the most important movements building support for change, the movements like Move to Amend or others that have rallied people to the constitutional change, despite the aspirations of them, it is really incredibly difficult to imagine amending the Constitution, which leads most people to resign themselves to the challenge of fixing this democracy. Death, taxes, and a corrupt government are the realities we must accept as Americans today. But there's a technical legal term to describe that claim that it's impossible to fix this problem without amending the Constitution, and let me just share it with you for free. This is pro bono. I'm going to give you this technical legal term. That argument is bullshit. Bullshit. Because whether or not the Constitution needs to be amended, right now we can change the way campaigns are funded through a statute. A statute. A statute like the American Anti Corruption Act, with rep which represent.us has put together, a statute like the one I describe in my book, which would create vouchers to give to every voter to fund small dollar funded elections, a statute like John Sarbanes, by the People Act, a statute which gets enacted by a Congress, a majority in Congress, or in our Congress, a supermajority in the Senate, but okay, 218 votes in the House, 60 votes in the Senate. I thought that kind of looked like a zip code, and I wondered, where is 21860? It turns out there isn't a 21860 in the United States, but it's close to Washington, so I think we should say that's the zip code for Congress. 21860, a Congress, a simple majority in Congress, which could pass this statute tomorrow. So the challenge then is, how do you get such a Congress? And what we began to recognize, the only way to get such a Congress, the only way to fix this system, this fix this system that is so corrupted by super PACs and large contributors, is to find a way to hack this system. And how better to hack the system than to hack it by developing our own super PAC, our own super PAC, the Mayday PAC, a super PAC to end all super PACs by winning, right, thank you, by winning a Congress committed to fundamental reform in the way campaigns are funded by passing such a statute by 2016. Now, you look at this and say, wait, 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 you want to use big money to end big money? <laughs> That's a little bit ironic, isn't it? And I say, right, as Lincoln said, we need to embrace the irony. <laughs> okay, Lincoln didn't actually say that. But the guy who said we were going to be given a government of, by, and for the people, he would have said we need to embrace the irony because it's the only thing we can embrace right now to stand up to the power that makes it impossible for this democracy to function. So we laid out a plan when we launched the Super PAC. We said we were going to first pilot in 2014 the idea that voters will vote, be persuaded on the basis of this issue, to prove that there's a reason to invest in the idea of electing a Congress committed to fundamental reform in 2016. So in 2014, we were going to run a limited number of races to demonstrate and prove that idea. And then in 2016, we would run a campaign to win a Congress committed to fundamental reform, assuming that we have shown in 2014 that it's possible at a price that we the people and some of those other 
funders would be willing to step up and support. And then in 2017, in the first 100 days of that Congress, we would get that reform passed, and then we would prepare to protect it through whatever changes in the Constitution were necessary after we had our first Congress elected, elected not by the tiniest fraction of the 1%, elected not by the Tweedies, but by elected by the people. And so in this... So in this year, the idea is to test, to prove. And so we pick a mix of races, a diverse mix from around the country, Republicans and Democrats alike, challengers and incumbents, to produce the data necessary to show what's possible so that we can convince, not us, but convince the skeptics who want to see this change, but are just not convinced this change is possible. The data necessary to show them that it is possible. This first stage is a proof of the idea that we, the people, will demand our democracy back. We launched this May Day pack on May Day. We said when we'd launch it, we were going to raise a million dollars in 30 days. We did that in 13 days. Then... Then six people matched that, giving us $2 million, and we launched a $5 million campaign in 30 days to climax on July 4th. And on July 4th, this extraordinary American tweeted, support. (laughs) And when he tweeted that support, $750,000 came into our campaign so that at 9 o'clock on July 4th, as the fireworks were going off all across the East Coast, we crossed the $5 million mark and met our goal of $5 million in 30 days. And then the fourth stage, which is turning out to be, for me, the hardest of these stages, but I am convinced this weekend it will be completed one way or the other if we can match that $5 $5 million with another $5 million in matched contributions, a big if, I guess, then we can step to the second big if, which is if we meet the goals of fundraising and run the elections in a way that demonstrates that the people care enough about this issue, then we will prove what we need to prove to build the movement to launch this campaign for 2016 to win a Congress committed to fundamental reform. That's the plan. That's the critical first stage of the plan. And you have been and will be an incredibly important part in that plan. Many of you, of course, Danny, of course, was the first, but the best thing that Danny did was this incredible video, the funniest video in the world, supporting our movement. You've got to see it. I would have showed it, but I didn't want to get you um, too embarrassed here. But an incredible video supporting our movement that you can see at the Mayday.us site. And of course, other projects related to this. Tomorrow there will be a hack for democracy which will build tools to help not just ours but other democracy-related projects, this hackathon here at MIT, to try to increase the number of people participating in this. And I'm announcing today something that we will be launching on Monday, a little bit of an echo of an incredible thing that happened about 10 years ago. You remember um, the Bush in 30 Seconds campaign? So 10 years ago, Move On launched this campaign to try to get people to create content that would try to capture in 30 seconds why President Bush should not be reelected. And an extraordinary range of content was created. They had promised they would run the winning ad on, um, in the Super Bowl, but then the Super Bowl refused to sell them the time. But okay, put that aside. Um, here was the winning ad. Incredibly powerful. It's one of the most viewed political ads. 
And the great thing about it, of course, is because it's Creative Commons license, you can just basically slap who's going to pay Obama's debt off now. I mean, it's the same thing. You can remix it, but the point is, it is an expression of the potential of turning not to professionals, but to the public to create. And so on Monday, we're launching an equivalent type of campaign, what we're going to call politics in 30 seconds. Um, where at the site, you're going to be able to upload your creativity, both generally about this issue and particularly as to the races we are in, so that we can build a similar incredible attention across YouTube for the whole month of October about the importance of this issue and what we need to do to rally the support for this change. Now, we are just one of many groups, many, many different groups, and that most of the most important are here represented at this conference. But many is the plan of this reform movement. People constantly say, why don't you guys all get together? <laughs> Just have one group. That's a fundamental mistake. Just like the progressives 100 years ago, what we need to do is define groups that span a range of Americans on the left and the right who think about these issues in slightly different ways, perhaps, but who can be focused on the common ground of finding a way to reclaim this democracy. And as I view it, the most important common grounds to find. Just as the civil rights movement saw that it needed to find blacks and whites working together for civil rights, we need to find a way to find the left and the right working together for this civil right of political equality, as well as the rich and the not-so-rich working together for this civil right of political equality. People stepping back from whether they are benefiting or not from this system and acting as citizens first, citizens who demand the recreation of an ideal we were taught as kids was our democracy. Now, why? As I thought about coming here to talk about this, I recognize that MIT brought me here. Quite literally, MIT brought me here. As the introduction mentioned, it was about eight years ago that I announced that I was going to give up the work I had been doing on copyright and intellectual property and internet policy and to focus my attention on this question of corruption. And I did that because of an extraordinary boy who had come to see me. <laughs> Aaron Swartz came to visit me where I was for the year at the American Academy in Berlin. Somebody who I'd worked with for about uh, eight years at that point on many different projects. He came to see me, and he came to ask me a question. And I was really excited to see Aaron because I was really proud to show him my latest work. I was finishing the last book I would write on copyright. I was preparing for my first TED Talk. This is Fat Larry there. Um, <laughs> his talk on the laws that choke creativity. I was so proud in describing this to him. And he kind of looked at me in a little bit of a dejected way, and he said, so, so I, I'm a little puzzled, so how, how do you think you're ever going to solve the problems you're talking about? So long as we have the system of corruption in the way our government works. Now, I was a little bit miffed at his question. I wanted him to be excited with me, and he wasn't excited with me, and so I pushed back. I said, you know, Aaron, it's, you know, it's, it's just not my field. <laughs> not my field. And he said, you mean as an academic, it's not your field? I said, yes, as an academic, it's not my field. I don't do that politics stuff. I do internet, IP, that's my field. He said, okay, fine. But as a citizen, as a citizen, is it your field as a citizen? Now, many people here knew Aaron. And what you know, if you remember him, 
is this is the way he was. He didn't lecture. He didn't, he didn't insist. He asked questions. But his questions spoke as clearly as a five-year-old hug. And with that question, he changed my life because I knew I couldn't, with integrity, look at him in his eyes and give him any excuse at all. So we resolved that night in Berlin that we would work together on this project. And I came back to Stanford and he and I and Josh Silver started this group called Change Congress, which was the first iteration of this project to rally people to this underlying corruption. But then a guy named Obama came along, and Aaron was, well, that's not actually Aaron, but he was about that old at the time. Aaron was attracted by the idea of this great progressive president, and he started a group called Demand Progress, because, you know, what he knew is that Obama was going to come in and get us climate change legislation, real health care reform. He'd break up the banks. We'd have new support for unions, true campaign finance reform, all that great stuff Aaron knew Obama was going to get us. And so he was going to help him with Demand Progress to get us that change. Now, I was less optimistic even though I was an Obama supporter, I was less optimistic and I teased him a bit about his giving up the cause. But I always believed he'd come back. I always believed there would be a time we'd work together on this issue again. But there wasn't a time. He didn't come back. Instead, he came here to MIT, in particular here, Building 16, in particular here, this closet in Building 16, where he installed a computer which was downloading articles from the academic site JSTOR. He had, quote, hacked the system to download these academic articles for purposes unknown. And in January of 2011, he was arrested, charged with 13 felonies, the U.S. attorney was proud to stand up before the press and announce that he was facing 35 years in jail for downloading too many academic articles for purposes unknown. Now, he was being charged under a statute called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which said that if you access a site without authorization or exceeding your authorized access, you commit a felony. But the puzzle here as many, including the New Yorker article here, described, was that he didn't hack into the MIT system. He didn't have to. MIT's network is open to anyone. It's a policy choice of MIT to have an open access network. Literally anyone is permitted to come in and open up your machine and get access to the internet and to plug into a wire in the wall and get access to the internet. So the point is, he had authorization. He had authorization. And after this whole tragedy was finished, MIT's report to the president was troubled about this fact, as they stated. Put differently, there is apparently an issue as to whether Aaron Swartz was authorized to access the network, because there was a policy of open access at MIT. As far as the review panel could determine, MIT was never asked by either the prosecutor or the defense whether Aaron Swartz's access to the network was authorized or unauthorized, nor did MIT ask this of itself. And as they conclude this section, the review panel wonders why. Because, of course, <laughs> If his access was authorized, there was no crime. And if there was no crime, there was no 13 felonies, no 35 years in jail. If there was no crime, there was no two years defending himself, one million dollars in legal fees to defend himself, if there was no crime. The review panel wonders why this pretty fundamental fact was not noticed. So do we. And as most of you know, 
two years after, having bled all of his resources dry, having recognized the freedom that he had enjoyed to do the work that he was doing would be over even if he won. Aaron took his life. He gave up. So I'm here at MIT to say, look, no event, nothing ever, nothing ever in my life has done so much to tear me up, to tear me up, because all of us knew there was more we could have done to bring that boy through this. There have been other events that have been as important, events like the birth of my children, but those events are the appropriate events to tear up your life, to shift you, to push you in different directions. But this, this was not. But this changed me. And since that moment, January 11th of last year, I find myself throwing myself off of tall buildings without any guarantee of a net beneath. Last October, we announced we're going to organize a march across New Hampshire in January so that on the anniversary of Aaron's death, we would begin in Dixville Notch and end up at Nashua, having crossed 185 miles with an incredible band of 20 people who did every step and about 200 people who participated in some way along the way, throwing myself across, off the building and being caught by these incredible souls, many of them in the audience tonight. And then in March, I announced this idea of the Mayday Pack. With what no one knew, certainly I didn't know, whether it was possible to raise a million dollars and get it matched and raise five million dollars and get that matched. No one knew it was possible, but it was a way to try to get us to a place so that on November 8th, 2016, we can celebrate discovering again the potential of a democracy on November 8th, 2016, which turns out to be the day Aaron would have turned 30. What MIT did was not to kill Aaron. MIT didn't mean to kill Aaron. MIT didn't even want to hurt Aaron. What MIT did was nothing. It knew and it did nothing. And as you focus on the anger that reality should produce, what I want you to do, the reason I've talked about this, why the reason I've put this right at the center of this talk, this talk here at MIT, I want you to recognize that what MIT did is just like what we do about this democracy, what the United States is doing about this democracy right now. Because we know, not we here, we here are doing as much as we can, but we as Americans, we know, but we do nothing. As the capacity to govern collapses, as our ability to deal with fundamental problems disappears, as people are desperate for an opportunity to participate in a society that grows again, we know and we do nothing. Now, I'm pretty convinced that Aaron would have loved the hack of a super PAC to end all super PACs. And he would have been proud if his work had been what inspired it. Because as much as he cared about open access and creative commons and digital libraries and the computer frauds and abuse act, he cared most about democracy. About the justice, the justice a democracy could give. about the justice our democracy does not give, but has to. I am here because of what MIT did. We are all here because of what MIT did, or what it didn't do. 
And let that lesson, let that lesson inspire us. Because this is the moral question of our time. This is the moral question of our time. The question that boy asked me, the question I now ask you. Can we reclaim this democracy? Can we reclaim this democracy? And if that be inspired by MIT, let it be better than MIT. Let it be as great as the people that MIT inspires. Let it be you who answer that question in the way he insisted with that simple question. We all had to answer it. I'm here because of MIT. I ask you to join all of us in making that question America's question and getting the answer we all know we have to find again. Thank you very much. Thank you.